if as theorists, as diverse as Aristotle, Hegel, and Bunetier have argued, conflict stands near the heart of drama, then alterity as a condition holds a similarly central position, since the tension between self and other is perhaps the most universal experience of conflict. Alterity, however, is at the root not only of dramatic action, but in another dimension at the root of theater as a phenomenological experience, since this experience is based on the creation of an alterity between ourselves and those creatures on stage, the, whose activities must be accepted as occurring in an alien reality. What is true for human actors then is even more powerfully true for puppets whose alterity is grounded not only in their alternate world, but in their very way of existing in that world and in ours. Alien as the human actor may be, the alterity of the puppet has always been even more profound and thus more unsettling. Hence the frequent association of the puppet with the uncanny. Although archeological evidence shows puppets in use for several thousand years in such diverse locations as Egypt, China, and India, their tradition has almost everywhere been a non-literary one. Their stories and dialogues passed down as they still are in many parts of the world today with oral, within an oral tradition. It is not until the 13th century in Egypt that we actually have a literary text created for puppet performance. Actually, a set of three plays written for an Egyptian aristocrat by the court poet Ibn Daniel. Ibn Daniel claims that these shadow puppet plays mark a new and more refined direction in the genre, and there is no reason to dispute his claim. He settled among the Cairo Bohemians in the Hamayaya quarter, many of whom, like himself, were, were political refugees or entertainers or both. The second play in his trilogy is essentially a series of vignettes of street performers from this group presenting their professional appeals or their particular performing skills and giving us an unparalleled glimpse into the street life of medieval Cairo. Ibn Daniel thus began his career as an other for respectable Egyptian society, both as an inhabitant of the Bohemian Quarter and as a refugee from far off Mosul. The puppet narrator of the first play of his trilogy, the eponymous Shadow Spirit, clearly has much in common with his creator. He is a witty, multi-talented, highly verbal inhabitant of Kusia recently arrived from Mosul. His profession, residence, and outsider status all reinforce his shadow alterity. But he has a similar feature. He has another feature, which adds another significant reinforcement. He is a seriously deformed hunchback. This feature is so important that a discussion of it opens the play and the trilogy. The presenter of the performance begins the play by summoning up its narrator, Taf Akahal, the, the, uh, whom he describes as, quote, a witty, humorous hunchback who in physical appearance looks like a shining crescent, unquote. As the hunchback appears on the screen and exhibits his deformity with a low bow, the presenter delivers the opening lyrics of the play to, as a, as, and these are a eulogy to humps in nature and in human beings. The fact that the oldest known puppet text begins with an association of its title character with humps, and therefore with a eulogy celebrating the hump in man as a feature of unusual beauty and attractiveness, not only reminds us of the importance of the hunchback in Western comedy in general, and in puppet theater in particular, 
but also in respect to the theme of this conference, it's one of the most obvious physical indications of alterity. When I started thinking about the thematic keyword of this conference, alterity, I found myself contrasting it with another term that has been on everyone's mind of late, diversity. Alterity, for me at least, conjures up images of difference, division, exclusion, and potential hostility toward whatever is alter, other, on the outside of oneself or community. Diversity, on the other hand, embraces multiplicity and promotes inclusion, <clears throat> evoking the image of a kaleidoscope rather than a binary opposition. How do we situate Sicilian puppet theater in relation to these two concepts? The truth is that one can find an abundance of examples of both alterity and diversity, along with episodes that lead the spectator from one perspective to the next." End quote. Resistance to the Bourbon occupation, according to Cuticchio, explains how the Orlando puppet came to wear a red, green, and white sash representing the colors of the new Italian flag. Although Bourbon domination ended over a century and a half ago, in some companies, Orlando still wears the tricolored sash. Returning to the fictional story of Agramante's invasion, as in the earlier plot involving his grandfather, Agolante, here too, there are key moments that push against the binary opposition between an us and a them. The shift from alterity to diversity is signaled most prominently by the enamorments of the Christian Frankish knight Bradamante, sister of the famed paladin Rinaldo, and the Saracen North African knight Ruggiero, the son of Ruggiero II and Galacella, who was born on the coast of Libya and raised in the Atlas Mountains. The two are technically enemies when they meet since Ruggiero is participating in Agramante's invasion of France, whereas Bradamante is one of Charlemagne's preeminent warriors. Yet Ruggiero courteously offers to take Bradamante's place against his fellow African Rodomonte, who refuses to let her follow the Frankish army in retreat. Although Bradamante initially accepts the offer and departs, she soon thereafter returns because her own sense of honor is higher on her value scale than her duty to follow the emperor. They end up falling in love because both have placed a universal code of chivalry and individual integrity above the interests of their respective rulers, as well as any religious, political, or ethnic distinctions. And we're off. Um, although the popular image of Commedia dell'arte persists as a comic form full of multicolored diamond pattern clad servants, elegantly outwitting older and stupider masters, its comic engine room is far more robust, focusing on differentials in social class, geographical region, perceptions of an inescapable present, a longed for future and constructed notions of, of beauty. It does not present, however, a single target for its professionally executed comic othering, but a complex pattern of relative othering, uh, depending on its audience and their geographical location, social class and relationship with time. Its, dramat its dramaturgic edifice, as far as it can be accurately constructed, evolved to contain highly adaptive and flexible performance structures capable of entertaining a wide range of audience types and switching its comic targets and target audience. Uh, the survival of Commedia dell'arte as Europe's first secular genre of theater is a model of constant mediation between the constructed and an majestically charged fixed social types and the performance situations the troops found themselves in. A comedia actor had the ability to place themselves either with the audience's sympathies or against it. The skills embodied within such a performer allow them to play with notions of otherness and adapt to the audience's circumstances. The actors of the original comedia were therefore self-fashioning individuals existing as outliers for humanism and hence set against the rigors of a, hege of a hegemonic Catholic Europe which was rooted in mankind's relationship with God alone. 
Um, so, but today our main concern is the representation of alterity through puppetry. So, um, in Karagos plays, we usually start, the plays usually start with um, a dialogue between two main characters, Karagos and Hajiwat, and that's where we start to get to know the characters. So, um, as Marvin Carlson suggested much about uh, Karagos, Karagos is usually represented or um, identified by his foolishness, antisocial behaviors, as well as his cleverness and creativity, maybe a, like a trickster-like figure. And an uh, uneducated uh, character, poor, unemployed, although most of the time he is presented as a blacksmith, unreserved, honest, aggressive, whereas Hajiwat we see as the, the father-like figure, figure, the representative of the culture. Uh, somewhere standing somewhere between not an upper class but like a medium between the common people and educated uh, members of the society. So when we talk about diversity and Karagos, uh, I should also note that um, there have been lots of discussions about uh, Karagos's place in the society, but diversity has been uh, a very, if you could say, positive uh, characteristic traits of Karagos. So scholars, uh, academics, or writings just after 1950s usually emphasize that Karagos was and still is maybe the uh, very good symbol of diversity, multiculturalism, multilingualism, which doesn't exist anymore, especially we see this type of attitude towards the, in the writings, um, which are critical about the politics following the establishment of the Republic. And in this interpretation, we see that um, the Karagos master wanted to be a part of uh, this group of artists who wanted to raise awareness towards uh, the refugee problems, the refugee politics worldwide. And he converted this scenario. So he used Karagos as the one who kind of tortures uh, the figure here. And he represented it as the um, symbol of um, the refugee. So the spokesman of the Republic, Karagos, the one who always says the truth, the one who represents the um, majority of the public suddenly becomes the, um, this, powers, let's say, the institutions who are the reason for the negative bad politics of the refugees. So what I would like to um, say, I do not have one simple, simple conclusion from these, because it is still a very lively art form, it is still uh, being practiced worldwide, but as a cultural heritage, and as a pride for um, representing the past pluralities of the Ottoman Empire. So how would Karagos be taken to further generations? Would that, be, would that mean changing its content, pulling out certain characters within it? This is ventriloquist John W. Cooper. Um, I'm not sure if this dummy is Sammy, his longtime alter ego. Or um, if so, it's one of the earlier versions of that puppet. As a youth, Cooper spent four years to touring New England, Canada, and the mid-Atlantic states with the Southern Jubilee Singers. During this time, he began developing his skills as a ventriloquist. Cooper subsequently joined Richards and Pringle's Georgia Minstrels, but never performed in blackface. His ventriloquist act appeared in the Olio or variety section of the show. The White Rat Strike of 1901 gave him the opportunity to break into mainstream vaudeville since theater managers were willing to hire black performers in place of striking white acts. Cooper frequently billed himself as bubbling over with songs and stories. So it is not surprising that words became the cornerstone of his self-promotion strategies. Evangelist Lena Doolin Mason commemorated Parker's bravery and loyalty to the nation in a poem, A Negro in It, using the opportunity to exhort 
white man, stop lynching and burning this black race, trying to thin it. For if you go to heaven or hell, you will find some Negroes in it. Mason's poem gave Cooper the self-assurance to assume the right to show up anywhere his talent took him. So what happens when the puppeteer's identity is a mask of its own and the objects engage the puppeteer's ambiguous relationship to that identity? What additional ambiguities are created in performance when the puppeteer's own characters either contribute to the mask their creator wears or deviate from it, even challenging it directly? Who in these cases is the other? Brown embraces the alterity at the core of puppetry. His objects talk back to their creators or challenge them directly in performance. Further evidence of this embrace of alterity lies in the company's commitment to near photographically realistic portrait puppets of various famous persons. Brown was a closeted gay man, including metaphors of sexual identity in his plays. Chassé was a man of mixed race who publicly identified as white, white while showcase, often showcasing uh, black subjects. Brown was closeted in public while in a lifelong relationship with fellow puppeteer Richard Brandon. The Chassé family, listed historically as mulatto, chose to identify as white, an effort in which Chassé actively engaged never acknowledging his own genetic connections to subjects he chose to represent, even reflecting in interviews of his depiction of black subjects as interest in communities of either his youth or in his travels as a merchant marine, but never his own. Mobilizing the silhouette and the shadow as key aesthetic tactics. Kara Walker has risen to prominence for her artistic renderings of historical imagery of the antebellum American South. Walker's work taps into stereotypical images and histories of representation and has been subject to scathing critiques, particularly early in her career. After Walker received the MacArthur Genius Fellowship in 1997, artist Betty Saar began a campaign to protest Walker's imagery, which she felt peddled the most egregious racial stereotypes. The same year, the International Review of African American Art charged Walker with repackaging damaging stereotypes and selling them to white audiences. Opposition to Walker's work has been demarcated by a generational divide that is further amplified by critics and historians' difficulty in theorizing the form and function of irony in general, and satire specifically. More contemporary reception of Walker's work attends to the way in which it holds space for the complexities and contradictions associated with bearing witness to trauma. Described as both beautiful and disturbing, and dealing with both pain and pleasure, Walker's art employs what Brenda Dixon Gottschild defines as the Africanist aesthetic, and that it deals in paradox as a matter of course, with irony following close behind. Walker's art can thus be understood as staging a traumatic sight that, according to Fried, surrounds, involves, and challenges the viewer to witness, acknowledge, and remember the individual and transgenerational trauma of slavery and contemporary racism in the United States. The layers of local meaning carried by such dolls gives these gingerbread men, as they were referred to, um, a particular situated intensity that speaks directly to the uncanny character of all effigies. Without the convenient cover of Halloween, as in Kentucky, or the cover of Popular Appeal, as in this next example, the hanging chair. So this occurred before Obama was elected in 2012, um, his re-election. So in the run up to the 2012 election, the internet was ablaze with bewilderment after Clint Eastwood's surprise appearance at the Republican National Convention in Tampa, Florida. The legendary actor-director who had already appeared in several events in support of Mitt Romney's campaign against the incumbent Obama proceeded to take the stage and improvise. He began to speak to an empty chair beside the podium as if he were having a conversation with Obama, complete with pauses for responses to his off-the-cuff questions about the failings of the administration. 
<clears throat> for anyone that has ever done an improv class, it was clear that Eastwood was potentially a little bit out of practice. Um, it was a bizarre moment, but it was the most memorable of the night. Conservative blogger Michelle Malkin encouraged her readers to display their own empty chairs and add decorations. Over the next few months, empty chairs began to appear in people's front yards. In Washington, Texas, Virginia, and Colorado, several people decided to hang their chairs from trees using rope. When questioned, the individuals offered that they needed to tie the chair like that because otherwise it would get stolen or they needed to mow the lawn and didn't want the chair in the way or simply just said that other people were reading too much into it. There were more overt chair displays around this time. Um, one in Minnesota was hung by what was very clearly an actual noose. Uh, a chair in California was attached to a fence post and a few days later, the owner placed two watermelons on the chair Still not satisfied, he hung a noose off the back of the chair and put a sign on it that read, Go Back to Kenya. The media response to these incidents was stunning by comparison to the 2008 Halloween effigy. Uh, the story quickly went viral. In addition to traditional news media, every outlet from the Atlantic to HuffPost to Salon weighed in on the issue, unilaterally condemning it and unabashedly discussing lynching as such. The absurdity of the Eastwood performance and the fact of the, the removal of the chair from any figurative representation lowered the issue to the point where contemporary discourse could reach it. The chairs were just ridiculous, and they were also accessible. The metaphor of the empty chair on par with the empty suit put the discussion into the realm of the metaphorical, allowing commentators to approach the topic from a safe distance, far from considerations of real human bodies either now or in the past. The use of the chair as a stand-in for a figurative effigy effectively rendered the object a surrogate for a surrogate, an effigy twice removed from its referent. The absence of an identifiable figure makes the effigy a more covert form of communication, one that depends on the knowledge of the inciting incident to understand it. It is a material instance of the rhetorical strategy of dog whistle politics in which veiled racist language appeals to a tar target demographic. Uh, yeah, I suppose just just kind of responding to that and 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 sort of broadly the 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 kind of uh, the range of of of, uh, of work that we've already heard about and and just the overall topic, I'm sort of struck by the the fact of puppetry being used to present alterity. Um, I think speaks to to something that I hear a lot within the industry, uh, within the the sort of puppetry uh, industry or or, or field. Um, uh, around the idea that puppets, uh, the wonderful thing about, you know, we, we often hear the wonderful thing about puppets is that anyone can can play anything or can play anyone or, or, or anything. And I wonder how much that is a sort of, I, I wonder how much, at least in the West, that uh, is about a reproduction of whiteness's idea of universality. So, so this, so uh, whiteness's sense of its own neutrality and whiteness's sense of being able to speak to a, an experience that is universally human. Um, and, and so I think an awful lot of what we see in, um, and, and, and you know, and I, I, I don't know that it's, I, I, it may well not be unique to the West, but within speaking from a Western context into a, to a Western context, um, I think there is, uh, you know, a lot of the anxieties we have about about how we represent the other is, uh, or, or about anxieties that exist within the West of how to represent the other, uh, because there is a basic assumption that it is uh, a right, an entitlement to represent the other, because there is a, a right and an entitlement to speak to universal human existence, which I think is uh, is something that that bears uh, scrutiny, um, and I think that you know puppetry provides a really interesting. Uh, opportunity to to kind of scrutinise something that, of course, is is an idea that we see reproduced across uh, across uh, different forms of of, of um, cultural production. Hi again. Um, so when I was doing this um, research and additional readings about this um, presentation, I came across a, a few um, representation of Turks in other um, theatres and puppetry in the Europe in Europe because there are, and it's not about theater or puppetry, but you know, that's um, Netflix series, 
they have this policy of including uh, not being in exclusive not including um, different uh, representatives of the society so there was this television series i think it was called the orthodox um, a jewish girl moving from uh, escaping from america to germany to berlin so you have these characters um, a gay couple a Muslim gay couple and other friends around her. So we know that there is a very high population of Turks living in Berlin. So throughout the series, I actually paid attention to see any Turks and there was none. Okay. So I just thought like, is it better to um, not caricature, to make it like a caricature or, someone has selling kebab in the middle of Berlin, or is it ignorance, like ignoring, excluding? Um, hey. Would we prefer to have someone stereotyped, ridiculed, or just totally ignored? Because this also reminds me of like recent discussions in Turkey. So if you think that certain type of people would be offended, so you take the Jew out of the play and then the Armenian, because that might cause problems maybe, and then the Greek. You can always perform a Kyrgyz play without any of these characters. Like there are um, performers in the past, they played the dialogue between Kyrgyz and Hajjavad for hours. So you don't need any of these characters. You can have animals, um, you can have um, supernatural elements. You don't need any of these. But would people be happy to, to not to see themselves, their community? That's, that might be another aspect, I thought. Uh, you know, I think that part of the reason that we're not talking freely right now is we live in a very politicized moment and people are all afraid of saying the wrong thing or whatever. So we, we should just acknowledge that and get over it. Certainly what draws many people to puppetry and I think within Asian puppetry as well as Western traditions, the stereotypes of the other are always there. They are not always well thought through about will this hurt that community or whatever they're often tossed in there for jokes or laughs and the stereotypes are played a hundred percent certainly the westerners are within an indonesian context uh so but right now uh, the reason you're having this forum and the reason that we're talking about it and have looked at some very troubling material this afternoon uh is because this discipline you know, has the possibility that a single person can traverse gender, race, sexuality, or whatever, and imagine themselves into those others. When we say only the person who has really had that experience can really make that puppet or play that character, in some sense, we're going back to a Stanislavski psychological model that the imagination can never carry us across that border of gender, or whatever, even if we take they as our pronoun, things like that. So, you know, it's uh, all I'm saying is right now, this is a hot topic. It makes people hesitate to do things that people have done for hundreds and thousands of years. So I'll be talking about three kinds of others, aliens, that's foreigners, religious others, and then physical and class differentiated other, others. So here you have a king from an overseas kingdom, um, the Raja Sabrangan in the middle, uh, Nur Sewan, who is the king in the Amir Hamza stories. He's a Persian, not Arab, which is defined in that role as Javanese. And uh, those Quan characters, also demons, have some of the characteristics of being class others, low class demons. 
So uh, there are, I think, two kinds of alien others. There are the simple kind of comic others. They usually appear in clown scenes, not central to the story. They're kasar, low class, coarse, and comic. And then there are the threatening others, the complex aliens who are integral to the plot, such as the Raja Sabrangan, the overseas king. So uh, two types of simple alien. One is sort of like we see the cavalcade of people in forms like karagos. They have language, dress, cultural peculiarities, their mind for fun. It's a simple, uh, kind of comedy. And then there are specific personalities, portrait puppets of well-known foreigners. They're usually also associated with clown skits. So I just want to say that although you are fighting the other, what we see all around uh, this area is the idea that that other is outside, he's from over the sea, but he is also inside. He is a spirit world. He is your anger, your uh, possibility of being other than refined. So what you have to do is become refined. That is the process of what puppetry is watching to make you realize that all those others, ugly, deformed, and greedy, they are in you. The Confucian classics form the basis of a social and moral value system in traditional China, which was enforced by a central bureaucracy, which emphasized cultural continuity. So the Chinese world was perceived as one great community, um, Da Tong, where everybody thinks and acts according to the same uh, rule book, which means that the canonical works of Confucius and other earlier philosophers, and all this within a strict hierarchical stru uh, structure. So as I said, white is sort of uh, uh, something the, the Chinese people and was perceived as a high class. So a, a top echelon of society the idea was to be white as most of the Chinese people were not white. They were working outside. They were incredibly sunburned and white was a, a, an example of your social position but not necessarily a good thing. If we go to the next uh, slide, some characters who have white in their faces are actually evil characters and white is also a sign of a possible evil intent. In short, China was a very, very uh, homogeneous society with many, many different nations, but in, in, a, in a way a very uh, not open to many influences. The, the theater and the, the performance of plays where foreign invaders came into the country were essential to create not only uh, a national coherence, um, but also uh, it was one of the main um, performances and, and it's still performed today everywhere in China. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, the figure of Sabrang or the overseas kings and warriors in the Wayang Gedok. So Raffles in the history of Java even said that the, big, the depiction of Panji in contemporary literature was like a Charlemagne of Java. In the much advanced development, Panji text also recounts about the heroic deeds of Panji in protecting Java from Sabrang enemies and also his later life as a king of Jenggolo or Koripan. Then Panji was considered as a, an historical progenitor of Japanese king, and his story continues to be retold in many artistic express, expressions, such as in Wayang Gedok. I see that the type of Sabrang and Jawa are, means to be a representation of both cultural and political reality in 18th to 20th century Japanese courts, particularly in Surakarta context. It could be temporarily concluded that the Sabrang term in Wayang Purwo refers to antithesis relationships between Pandowo and Kurowo, and then human and demon, 
dharma and adharma and etc. But in the Wayang Gedok, the concept of sabrang was not only refers to an opposite opposite sense, but also political, cultural, and geographical. During three months in 2019, I conducted research at five major collections. I couldn't find any research on this subject, which surprised me. And the German curators also recognized the problem of this scholarly void. The valuable work on race and puppetry, including by people at this conference, has been very helpful. But it's important here to examine race and its depiction in a German context. One of the many problems is what to call these puppets. Many, especially from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, are labeled with German racist slurs. I'm applying the term blackface to these puppets based on Eric Lott's description of blackface minstrelsy as less a sign of absolute white power and control than of panic, anxiety, terror, and pleasure. Providing viewers with, con with context is, of course, essential. In Dresden, Loch uh, hopes to tell something about what a blackface puppet was used for, what it was made for, what stories were told with this puppet. The reason blackface puppets existed then and should be exhibited, according to Loch, is that they are needed for the stories that were being told. The most common way to provide context is, of course, with didactics. In the past, a common approach was to simply to display the material, because, as our Belding explained, there is no need to explain racism. It's clear. Uh, Rebain is a strong proponent of letting people make up their own minds. If someone is a racist, he said, you can't change his ideas in one small exhibit. But for people with open minds, they have the chance to get new ideas. Our building, however, feels that in the 21st century, there is a greater need to explain things and to show what you are thinking about. The problem is that one can't be sure what the visitor will, that the visitor will be aware of the problem, will discuss it, and will have the right questions. Why is one showing these particular puppets as opposed to others? And if one does show them, what is the context? What story is one telling? The value of a special exhibit, for example, is that it neither hides nor normalizes the puppets. Instead, one can put a spotlight on them, their history and their context. The issue, therefore, is not one of suppressing or censoring. The puppets are available for scholars and can be shown when it is appropriate, in the right context, in the right way, and at the right time. Museums can then be intentional about what visitors take away from the exhibit. Mamalenko is traditionally practiced to this date more intensely in its birthplace, the northeastern uh, states of the country. The form was born out of successive amalgamations of European, African, and indigenous features. From early influences of Commedia dell'arte, echoing uh, elements of French guignol and English punch and jury traditions, so uh, the term mamulengo comes from the junction of two words, words momolenga, which means uh, flexible or loose hands, referring to the puppeteer's uh, hand movements when manipulating uh, a glove puppet. In the shows, even though there is an initial basic plot line, the dialogues are created during the performance and improvisation plays a major role. Uh, it is difficult to speak of mamulengo and other uh, folkloric manifestations in Brazil, uh, without considering the issues of slavery and colonialism, which is the context in which they were uh, born. So here we see the image of Benjamin de Oliveira, who was uh, the, the, the very first uh, Brazilian black clown. Um, he was a very popular artist in the so-called Brazilian Belle Epoque in the beginning of the 20th century. Still a popular theater made by common people and addressed to common people, presents the world as a reality that is constantly changing and reshaping itself, unveiling its contradictions, and thus transforming society's dynamics towards freedom and a better uh, society. A general overview cannot fail to know that the frequent appearance of Jews in various forms is a distinctive feature of such place. Such figures appeared in dramatic and acting roles in ceremonial folk plays and interludes. This is unmistak the unmistakable influence of Poland, where such motif motifs appear frequently in folk theater and literature. They begin to appear in folklore with the waves of antisemitism in the 17th and 18th centuries. Jewish figures appear as caricatures in Polish and Slovak plays, usually performing comedic 
comedic functions, uh, end of, quot of quotation. Folk theater is no longer a developing phenomenon. It uh, survives mainly as an object of ethnographic research. The research and filmmaking activities of Martin Slivka, whose documentary films from, from the 60s of 20th century, recorded an authentic portrait of Slovak folk customs and place in the second half of the 20th century, are without equal and form an integral part of Slovak cultural heritage gives only marginal attention to Romani people and the issues that affect them. Jewish figures don't appear in modern puppetry. There is a logical explanation for this. The dramaturgy of the professional puppet theaters established in Czechoslovakia between 1949 and 1960 was oriented towards works for children. And under socialism, topics like the Holocaust were not discussed openly. In the drag theater, Hradec Králové, Czech Republic, a Romani fairy tale Kalomitraž was staged by famous director Josef Krofta in 1982. The play with the gypsy hero, named the same as the hero of the play Nothing, presented a story based on the conflict of the good and the maleficence. There is a racism directed to Romani minority, which maleficence represents in the play. The staging's ideological purpose was to condemn the racism to protest against the oppression of people who were of the different origin. Puppet and marionette theaters could not stay separate from the events. Puppeteers were called up for military service. Their venues, many of which were located in the front five zones of Belgium and the north of France, were closed or destroyed. Performances of puppet or shadow theater were often given in the real lines, military hospitals, and prison camps. Behind the lines, children attended puppet performances in which the familiar heroes had donned a uniform and exchanged a gingle stick for a gun. Just after war was declared, the puppeteer Gaston Coney modified the name of his booth in Paris, it became the Guignol de la Guerre, uh, Guignol at War. Their daily performances of Connie's war monitoring and patriotic repertoire were given for children and families. For example, Guignol in the Trenches, Guignol against the Fritz Toys, or the Kaiser Spy. But the printed books and booklets of the plays I mentioned are the main documents at our disposal to analyze puppet dramaturgy during World War I. While the hero kept his local identity, he had to fight opponents who were representative of entire nations. The Guignol of Lyon fought against generic Germans. The hamburger Casper Puccinell fought against Frenchmen, Englishmen, Italians, or Russians, all delocalized quintessential. Identities are never unified and in late modern times increasingly fragmented and fractured, never singular but multiply. Puppetry and object theater represent refugees using metaphors and engaging with their stories as a strong form. Next slide. Kenneth Gross suggested that puppets are fragmented versions of a human creature. What the gross suggested fits when the puppet appears as body parts or as of mixed materials and the hybrid objects. Next slide. But how do we find authentic representations for absent fragmented refugees, bodies and their fragmented identities? In escape, puppets represent a human body. For example, a human figure painted with a dark color represented the father and son literally. Next slide. While in war maker, objects and materials stand metaphorically for refugees, such as using salt and matches to represent Karim Shaheen's family. Using the matches opens other big meanings. 
We often see fire as a danger, but also as a light or intimacy provider, a guide, a candle's light, a warmth and shelter. The match is a fragile matter. We can tear, destroy, break, burn, transform it into ashes, and it can leave traces. In another scene, salt will represent Karim's family. Salt inhabits the soil, the sea, the roots, our bodies, and the food. It brings connotations of love in literature and popular culture. It's hard to uproot salt from the soil, as well as forced displacement of refugees cannot prevent their connection and love rooted in their hearts and souls to their homelands. Warmaker offers rep representation of multiple identities for the refugees and conveys their objection and dehumanization. For example, salt, match, spoon to represent Karim. The object's transformation and fragmentation open wider interpretations and associations. However, supporting refugees' visibility and the formation of their cultural identity may rely on the context, audience's background of knowledge, and the way we integrate the objects or materials in a theater performance. I suggest that using objects and materials in a refugee performance may emphasize their fragmented identity, resist stereotypes, generate empathy, because it offers associations, opens wider interpretations, and adds other layers of meanings. One day, I shall become what I want. One day, I shall become a thought. One day, we shall become what we want. The journey hasn't begun, and the path hasn't ended. The myth of you is reborn as an allegory of a dispossessed and violated Africa, the victim of colonialism and dictatorships, a country capable of generating only children born from these wounds, but perhaps also of generating a change, a new future. But let's now come to the analysis of the use of the puppet in the rendering of this polyphony of the absent characters. As we said before, Io does not appear in the list of characters. The stage directions are the place where Io's character is, is named, and there she is evoked as a puppet. Anna is the first to manipulate the puppet. In fact, the second stage direction of the play says, we see Anna with the puppet of Io. Anna comes the hair of Io's puppet. Anna never directly impersonates Io. She speaks through the puppet. In this way, Io's voice is conveyed by the puppet. But Io's puppet is not the only one evoked in Efui's text. At times, the author alludes to other puppets or fetishes when the characters referred to are absent from the stage action but present in the dramatic action in order to render the polyphony of the absent characters we mentioned before. Thus, when the actors from the La Grande Royale Company reveal which role in Prometheus Bound they are playing, another stage direction indicates that for each character named, I quote, a fragment of costume, a mask, an accessory, end quote, will be displayed. That is, an object instead of the performer, the object will thus act as a witness to an absent actor. In fact, all the characters evoked through the puppets are symbols of the condition of non-existence. Both Io and the African teenage mothers are illegitimate, alienated figures, and not only in physical and geographical terms. They are, first and foremost, strangers to themselves, unable to perceive their own identity, transformed by violence into inanimate objects, victims of the exile of conscience. In Kosiefui's writing, the performative object creates a channel of communication through which it is possible to glimpse the unspeakable. White mediums in the 19th century silenced the voices of actual Black people by creating a figure of a passive Black other. 
a figure that was objectified in more ways than one, framed as a symbol of darkness and death, but also significantly for the interests of this symposium, approached as an avatar for matter. Understanding how this racial metaphysics was enacted in the 19th century, I suggest may help puppet scholars think about how alterity can be represented in performance, not just through binary character identities, but as structural forces, spirit and matter. I approach the question of whiteness and performing objects through occult history, because I believe a certain spiritualist materialism, which became predominant in the 19th century, has taken up residence in American culture as a fascination with objects. In spiritualist performances, discourses of race were grounded in occult rituals. Mediums attempted to spiritualize matter, which they frequently enacted as biracial touch or collaboration. Sylvia Winter writes of the importance of the minstrel show in constructing white identity, arguing that Sam the Sambo character signifies as a return to nature, a figure of longing for white people who were anxious about the mechanization of life under modernity. And whether or not white mediums dealt directly with the racial contradictions involved, the implicit frame of spirit and matter kept them rehearsing a racial metaphysics that was deadly for black people and I suggest you know, persists and still is. What does it mean in, in some instances for a white puppeteer to control a black puppet, for, for example? As one commenter asked of Caroline Collins' performance, could it be spiritual blackface? I am struck by contemporary debates about whiteness. L Linda Martine Alcoff, for instance, who argues that white people must find a specific, I, um, they must find a way to accept their own specific white identities. Because whiteness has a history of being an occult transcendent category, I see the challenge in bringing whiteness back to the ground. Perhaps if we approach the problem in this way, looking at magical racialized objects, we can show how mythic whiteness was constructed and see more clearly the absurdity that covers up the violence. Now, the persistence of snake worship in Chen Bu play, although in most of the marionette plays on, on this goddess, her most significant accomplishment is her subjugation of a snake demoness. The snake sprite remains a goddess in one of the plays. I was really surprised to see this. Now, a banana python and his three sons, uh, the ninth Shu, the 10th Shi and 11th Shi are snake gods who became human. And I, I interpret that as they became Han Chinese and were uh, co-opted by Buddhism, Taoism, and the Confucian state, which means the Chinese imperial state. And we see their, their um, uh, temples. We still see them around Fuqin, uh, here's one, here's another one. In the, the religious marionette place on this particular snake god, uh, Banana Python, uh, I found two main versions in two different areas. Um, the great sublimation of the sprite. Sublimation means um, uh, 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 the transformation of uh, uh, a sprite into a human form, and then uh, uh, you know uh, they there's something like a celestial. They become gods afterwards. The the goddess uh, she is uh, doing her ritual in uh, subduing the snake. We'll see at this point uh, the snake is a woman. Is a, uh, it comes as a woman and she turns it back to its monster form. Uh, notice the, the, uh, uh, the, the face changes into that of a monster. And then, okay, she's going to, this is the climax. She's going to draw out the snake and subdue it. And we can see, we can hear the, the, we can uh, um, see, okay, so the snake is subdued and 
this is the end. And we have now, this is another play where the snake is now going to be, uh, by, uh, going to have the stamp by a Taoist, uh, uh, the Jade Emperor's attendant. And this will enable him to become uh, sublimated later. Now he can turn into a human being. And he turns, he turns into, turns into a, a, a boy and decides that he needs more clout. So he turns himself into a handsome young man instead of uh, a boy. So this is him. A lot of religious rituals, they have to actually go to the countryside to dig up a wild banana tree, which represents the banana python, the banana uh, god. I term this practice critical puppetry, wherein phenomena inherent to the form of puppetry are used to critique or resist politically constructed hierarchies of value within a performance. I suggest that intentionally or otherwise, there are many examples of critical puppetry already in existence. Indeed, from what we heard earlier today, I suspect we could make a case for the work of Hussam Abed or Kosi Efwi as instances of critical puppetry. Interestingly, while both reviewers and Mengele have commented on the inauthenticity of the casting of Butterfly and other Japanese characters, these same people have not questioned the Japanese identity of Soro and Chocho-san as played by puppets. So if we acknowledge, uh, on the one hand, Chocho-san's human casting as uh, being racial mimicry, then how do we understand the relationship between the non-Japanese puppeteers and the Japanese and mixed-race characters they portray? I suggest that either the act of puppetry is effectively occluding the race of the performers, or that they are not understood, the puppeteers are not understood as performing the characters in the same manner that the singers are. We must consider not only the content of a work, but also the aesthetic mechanism of theatricality. So let's approach the scene again, this time focusing on the mechanics of representation. Patricia Raquette runs upstage and throws back three paper screens, revealing a small humanoid puppet with a bald head, large ears, black eyes and tan skin, considerably darker than that of Raquette, who appears to be Caucasian. It is dark at the back of the stage, but after a second we can make out three veiled figures operating the puppet. One of them lifts the puppet's left hand towards Raquette, who stoops as the three puppeteers lift the puppet into her arms. One puppeteer directs the puppet's face towards Raquette. And our son, she asks. As Raquette and the puppeteers lower the puppet to the floor, the lighting allows us to see their veiled faces, particularly that of lead puppeteer Mark Petrosino, who also appears to be Caucasian. Petrosino's gaze remains fixed on the head of the puppet, and when Raquette takes the puppet's hand, his expression becomes one of excitable delight. Looking at Sorrow's design, the puppet's face displays exaggeratedly East Asian features, particularly for a mixed race child, and is striking in its proximity to yellow peril iconography and the stage makeup employed by Caucasian actors to mimic East Asians. Compare the colouring, ears and head shape of these two depictions uh, in the slide to, well, for example, my own. Now, it's unlikely that this was the intent of Nick Barnes, the puppet maker, but nevertheless, the design brings to mind Daniel York Lowe's assertion that such was the ubiquity and cultural currency of yellowface and other stereotypical depictions of East Asians in latter 20th century Western culture, that many industry figures still today retain a warped and inaccurate idea of how East Asian people actually look. Now, crucially, this puppet was not originally designed as a Japanese Eurasian child. According to Blind Summit director Mark Down, the puppet was repurposed from an earlier show and was originally built as a Chinese child. Now, this substitution unavoidably brings to mind Western perceptions of the interchangeability of Asian identities, as recently typified by COVID-related Sinophobic attacks on non-Chinese Asians. Furthermore, given that Soro's white American parentage is key to the narrative and that the libretto contains descriptions which are explicitly contradicted by the appearance of the puppet, Soro can be understood to be rendered extra other by use of this particular puppet. As with Soro, I suggest that any representational issues are in fact compounded by the framing of the puppetry as culturally authentic. 
Now, watching Puccini's opera, we are likely under no illusion that the work itself is authentically Japanese. Yet, by mobilizing the concept of authentically Japanese bunraku puppetry, the production seeks to convey an idea of authenticity that does not in fact involve any Japanese authorship. I endorse Chris Good's assertion that the politics of a theatrical work may reside most strongly not in the content of the work, but rather in its form. Further, I, I suggest that any critique of representational practices must look beyond the artists directly visible in these representations and instead consider the structures of power and authorship in which these representations are made. Puppeteers working on mainstream productions, after all, are themselves often marginalized by institutions which seldom accord them the necessary resources of time or money. And these institutions themselves are subject to boards and funding structures, which may discourage change and innovation and so And, and so I, I put on the, uh, the mask and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I aggressively stuck out my hand to, uh, to shake with, the, uh, uh, with, with the, the leader of the troop. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, he, was, uh, he was quite taken aback by this aggressive behavior of mine. Uh, after all, uh, Ludruk is known as a Kassar form. It comes out of the villages, out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the urban centers, the poor centers of, of uh, the cities. But, but nonetheless, my behavior as the aggressive tourist took him by surprise. Yeah. Okay. Now, at this point, I uh, show him the, uh, the book that I was using, uh, which is Practical Indonesian. Uh, and uh, Practical Indonesian has on its front cover a picture of Petruk. And here's where the uh, markers of alterity begin to come into play. Uh, this is Petruk. This is me. And uh, you may notice that the, uh, the mask that I was wearing has a very prominent nose. The mask makers in Bali always complain about how much wood they have to dig out. Uh, and uh, the racial markers are beginning to come into play here now. So I'm not certain that we're solving uh, racial problems here. But we're certainly marking otherness and imitating Balinese dance. He chases me off the stage. And subverts whatever power dynamic there is in the tourists control over the economy. It seems that puppet and object performance by definition is supposed to perform others. The puppet is always an other, as, as been, it was, was stated yesterday. It lends itself to non-realistic representation and image languages of color, shape, and exaggerated physical features. It seems to work best with such ex aesthetic exaggerations, which seem to define world puppetry and mask performance in any event. So we seem to be stuck with the exaggerated non-realism of puppet aesthetics. But does this mean, and also the separations, but does this mean we are also stuck with racism and racist representation? I would like to think not. I don't think realistic representation is key or even useful in puppetry, but maybe there are ways puppeteers can employ the traditionally extravagant aesthetics of puppetry in more conscious and maybe more positive ways of representing others. When Paulette Richards and the rest of our Living Objects African American Puppetry Advisory Group talked about representation of others in 2019, and I think we were specifically wondering if, if there are contexts in which white puppeteers could operate black puppets, the response was that if done with, quote, respect, that the representation of others could happen. That was, and seems to me now, a provisional and a partial response. And even our symposium has shown that all representations via puppetry are complicated, even at first glance, and even more complicated the deeper one looks into their history and function. I would like to think that puppetry, in addition to serving as a vehicle for racist or other forms of intolerant representation, could also serve as a positive means of representing difference. Has that happened in the past? And if so, how? What are the specific ways that representation of others could happen? Virtue, sign virtue signaling aside, 
I would like to imagine if and how such efforts and many others could be construed or newly created in puppet performances that could depend on positive imaginings of what a society based on justice, mutual respect and recognition could look like. Many aspects of this symposium make me think this could be possible. Thank you. Uh, Bill Condi like, repeatedly emphasized, it is not what we need to understand then what I really try hard in uh, working on the forthcoming exhibition at the Ballard Institute is that recognize that it's not the representation of real people. It's the imagined and then it's fantasies and um, it's the, yeah, in the image, imagination of the makers, not just the makers, puppeteers, not just that, it's the imagination of the audience and the society. Secondly, probably my take on this is um, slightly different. Perhaps I'm not very myself, maybe coming from maybe Asian perspective, perhaps. I'm not very concerned with that portraying the other positively or with respect or authentic. That's not what I'm concerned with in a way. You know, Asians come where we have bad and good things. We have, we, it's, uh, I think it is what is important for me is that understanding the com complexity of, uh, or, uh, of everyone, <laughs> everyone, whole world. So um, it's not um, about portraying them in positive way, it is not, I think it's more about putting this portrayal of others as a, this caricature as the ultimate truth. That is the problem. Then that's and simplifying it. I think it need to be out there as a gateway to understanding, not the closing down the, uh, uh, the more complexity behind it. Um, I don't know if it makes sense. Yes. So, I mean, like pretty simple. Like, not I'm not very concerned with the, like uh, me being portrayed in a like, negative or positive way. I think it's because what it is about is understanding the complexity. Um, and then I on I see in many ways that uh, is that Orientalism is actually uh, like, uh, uh, like othering the Asians happens in many ways under the guise of respect. Um, um, so I don't, oh, that's beautiful, that's Asian, and then that's, that's Asia. That is, uh, and then don't question it critically is, uh, is a kind it, to me that is oriental part is kind of orientalism i just wanted to echo something that has had an impact on me just listening to toby's talk and how he um talked about critical puppetry um so really thinking about the form of puppetry being um you know looking at the affordances that puppets allow us to think through these really difficult issues and thinking about how identities are constructed um and so I, I was hearing what you were saying um, about not, not looking for the right and the wrong, but the how, the consequences, um, and the opportunity. Um, I guess I, I'm thinking when we think about like why puppet, why the, the, the way this discussion revolves around puppetry, this idea of um, taking maybe ideas or notions or discourse that's around alterity and making something concrete you know, that's a physicalized object that embodies it. And then there it is for everybody to look at. And then thinking about these museum collections and the way these, these objects linger. I mean, puppetry is always about the stuff. And then you've taken something that maybe is, um, maybe it's a very uh, strong, uh, part of discourse in um, in a culture, uh, maybe it's represented in other ways, but you've not just represented it, but you, you've made this kind of concrete thing that then everybody has to kind of encounter and deal with in some way, and then this lingering of these objects in very physicalized terms. Someone coming from a Turkish culture who has 
uh, taken uh, many dramatic elements from the West, and we have been trying to create our own voice in the face of uh, what we are taking from Western drama and Western literature, we have very interesting creative processes and use of puppetry. So I think we should look more into the role of translation because uh, everything we have been discussing here for two days is also related to translation in terms of agency, in terms of identity, in terms of politics, in terms of political engagement. Uh, so maybe we can rethink about these things in terms of translation. Thank you uh, very much, everybody. Uh, it has been um, more than useful for us because, you know, we are in the middle of uh, COVID-19. I think we are the world's second city, the world's second uh, country. So it has been a relief to hear your voices. Thank you.